past few weeks I've been telling people about this talk and they get really excited for me, which is wonderful. Um, and naturally, they want to know what it's about. So I say, sexual fantasies. <laughs> and they go, oh, interesting. <laughs> and you know, when someone says interesting, really, that's not what they actually mean. <laughs> They're like, dear Lord, help me get out of here. <laughs> Sex is hard to talk about. A beloved professor once told me that if I wanted to talk about sexuality openly, I needed to be willing to feel the collective shame that most of us hold. And she was right. Sex and sexuality are seen as inappropriate topics of conversation in most spaces. But eroticism is a core ingredient of being human, which means we are literally ashamed of an integral part of who we are. My daughter has been asking me about sex for a while now. And when we told her I was pregnant with her brother, she went, hmm. And I said, what's happening? And she said, mama, why didn't you call me when you were making him? I wanted to be there. <laughs> the point is, is that when we make space for the topic of sex to come up openly, it does. But for most of us, that was not the case. There was no space for the topic of sex to come up naturally. So the question is, how do we make space for us to think, feel, and talk about sex in a culture that finds it extremely uncomfortable to talk about it? One way is through sexual fantasies. Fantasy is the activity of imagining something, that which happens inside of our minds. Now, sexual fantasies are just simply relating to the erotic imagination, um, like a naughty daydream that may last a split second, and we may not even be aware of it, to several hours. Because sexual fantasy happens inside of our minds, it's safe to be there because only we know. A fantasy is private. It belongs inside our imaginations. Threesomes. <laughs> Orgies, <laughs> bondage, dominance, discipline, submission, masochism, power, control, intimacy, adventure, novelty, romance. These are some of the most popular themes of sexual fantasies that Americans are having according to the largest survey done in this country. This survey also told us that 97% of us are having sexual fantasies. So, if essentially all of us are having sexual thoughts, why is it that every time I talk about sexual fantasies, I encounter either nervous laughter, awkward silences, or just a direct change in conversation? Pause and notice for a moment, how are you doing right now? Did any embarrassment or shame come up for you? In my work as a couples therapist and as a sex researcher, I have found that one of the main obstacles that keeps people from connecting to their sexual fantasies is the belief and the fear that if I have a sexual thought, it must mean I want to act on it. That scares people. Imagine for a moment that you're in a tropical country in the summer. It is hot, it is humid. Now don't worry, I'm not gonna lead you through one of my personal sexual fantasies. <laughs> but go back to this tropical country. It's late at night and you go to bed which is positioned right underneath the window that looks up into the sky. At four in the morning, you get awakened with a powerful rainstorm. The thunder shakes up the entire house. The raindrops slap the roof continuously and the lightning ignites the entire sky, which you can see through the window right above your head. This was me a few months ago. I was really scared. I lay in bed trying to fall asleep in a body that was trying to pretend that the thunderstorm wasn't happening. A while later, unable to fall asleep, I just told myself, Lucia, turn around, face the window and watch the storm. 
So I did, and as I witnessed this amazing spectacle, I could see my nervous system began, begin to soften, my fear was subsiding, and I was beginning to love it. Fear had turned into awe, which later became so peaceful that I eventually fell asleep watching the storm. Sexual energy is like that storm. It is powerful, scary, fierce, beautiful, and part of nature. Inside of us, there's a window to watch that storm. That window is our sexual fantasies. All we have to do is turn and face the window. We're not required to go out into the storm, but we are required to acknowledge its existence and watch it if we want to stop pretending it's not there. What we also need, though, is to prepare ourselves to come face to face with our internal defenses. The mind is brilliant. It comes up with amazing, sophisticated tools to help us ignore that which is uncomfortable, taboos. We need to be prepared to look at our internalized taboos. Now, you may be asking yourself, why on earth would I spend my time and energy looking at embarrassing, uncomfortable sexual taboos? Well, unless you're into pain and masochism. Sherry Winston, a renowned sex therapist, tells us that sexual energy is our primal power, the deepest expression of creation and a pulsating life force. We're literally created from sexual energy, and that gives us vitality, a feeling of being fully alive. Now, if these words are a little boo-boo for you, let me translate them into more scientific language. Let's begin with pleasure. That permission we give ourselves to delight in tasting, touching, seeing, hearing, and smelling. The senses are life's passport to enjoyment and pleasure. Studies have shown that those who acknowledge their sexual fantasies in both solo and partnered sex not only experience more arousal, but are more likely to have orgasms. Now, if having more orgasms and arousal is not enough reason to have you look at your sexual fantasies, let me tell you this. Other studies showed that the more guilt and shame one felt for having sexual fantasies during partnered sex, the more unsatisfied they were in partnerships and the more likely they were to experience sexual dysfunction. Now, this makes sense to me. Think about the difference between eating chocolate cake while feeling... <laughs> It, it was different seeing it on the computer than on the big screen. <laughs> but think about the difference between eating chocolate cake while feeling bad about myself, feeling like I shouldn't be doing this, this is horrible of me, versus eating chocolate cake while being fully <laughs> open to delighting in this amazing experience. In the imagination, we also play different roles, roles that are hard or even impossible to manifest in real life. Think about people that have a lot of responsibility in, in their day-to-day -day lives. They manage people. They have to be constantly making decisions. There's a lot of stress. These people often fantasize about completely surrendering, being submissive, and being dominated. They get to play a role in their sexual fantasies that they cannot play in real life. On the other hand, those who lack power, those who lack the space to voice their opinions in real life, often fantasize about being powerful, dominating, and forceful. Again, they get to play a role that they have no space to play in real life. A modern example of women, mostly women, playing out roles is through boudoir photo shoots. These are photo shoots where women get to imagine themselves, dress up, and act like the sensual beings that they are. 
There are thousands of women out there talking about what low self-esteem they have due to poor body image, due to being in abusive relationships, or pain and trauma of all different kinds. But through the support of an amazing community of women and a loving photographer, these women were able to tap into their sexual fantasies and play the roles of femme fatale, of dominatrix, of exotic dancer, and many others. They came out of this experience transformed, talking about what boost and self-esteem they experienced and a sense of inner freedom that they had not known before. Nancy Friday, an expert on sexual fantasies, tells us that fantasies are like the true x-rays to our sexual souls. Similarly, Jack Morin says that fantasies are like microchips that carry our subconscious longings and insecurities. In my work with couples, one challenge, a common challenge that comes up is that of low eroticism and a longing for more sexual intimacy. Esther Perel tells us that for the erotic to be alive, we need a sense of the unknown, a sense of space, some novelty, mystery, and adventure. For a lot of long-term relationships, that starts to decrease, and the pandemic honestly hasn't helped. One way that I support couples through this challenge is exploring their sexual fantasies. A common sexual fantasy is that of having an affair or multiple sexual partners. When people admit that, they feel horrible, they feel ashamed. Uh, why would I be having a sexual fantasy of cheating on my partner when I love them? I don't want to cheat on them. Exploring their sexual fantasy shows them that their imagination is brilliant. It's coming up with a solution to their problem. The problem is that the fire has dwindled. The solution is to add adventure, novelty, space, unknown. Not only do they come out of this with a solution, but they come out of this feeling relieved and having a deeper understanding of themselves. And for those who choose to share their fantasies with their partners, they also come out of this with a deeper sense of connection. When we allow the erotic imagination to play its movies, we feel more relaxed. There's nothing we have to hide from ourselves. We accept that which is unacceptable, and we shed light onto the deepest corners of our psyche. The more we talk about sexual fantasies and eroticism, the less embarrassing, the less taboo it is. And that makes space for us to talk about pleasure, enjoyment, and delight. Sexual fantasies show us our rawest desires, unpasteurized, crude, and utterly delicious. They give us wings, to live that which we choose not to live in real life. They provide us with an inner world that is much freer than the external world we live in. And that inner world, if we allow ourselves to access it, can gift us with a self-acceptance, an understanding of ourselves, and a freedom that can transform how we live our lives. <laughs>